Some of us are locked out of our own blessings because we can't even appreciate other folks being blessed first. So watch this, Jared. God will make me sit in the front row and watch person after person after person come on the stage in my life and come and go, dang, they blessed, dang, they blessed, dang, they blessed, dang, they blessed. And and I'm encouraged initially, I'm going to get mine. I'm encouraged initially, mine is coming. But what happens when yours don't come, it could be because you ain't ready to receive it. You haven't really, ooh, watch this. You haven't embraced the fact that they got theirs regardless of whether or not you get yours. Mm. See, I want people that's going to celebrate with me. Even if they lights do get cut off, you still going to celebrate with me. Even if you don't get the job, you still going to celebrate with me. I don't need you to shout because you got something to shout about. Shout with me just because you love me, because you love him, because you want to see good things happening. Mm. See, that's the kingdom mindset right there. Hey, because you blessed, I thank God that you blessed. I don't need anything for myself. It's not emotional for me. It's all kingdom for me. I'm glad that you got yours. And because I believe because I'm connected to you, there's something I can learn about what God is doing in your life. Even if it's not tangible, I know there's something that I can learn because of your faithfulness, because of your patience, because of your joy, because of the love you exude. There's something I can glean from you just by being around you. I don't want nothing from you. It's all about God's kingdom. Mm. Mm. But, but when we emotional, when mine come in. We're in a series right now called It's Bigger Than Me. And this series, my hope is that it's been challenging us to think deeply, intentionally about how we position ourselves as it relates to God's will, God's agenda, God's purpose and plan beyond our lives. It's hard for us to grasp this idea that I must put myself second. Because society teaches us, Brother Corbin, Brother Reggie, that if we are good... (laughs) Everything else is secondary. But the God we serve, he challenges us to ignore this notion that once I am good, then nothing else really matters. No, there comes a point in time in our lives where we must pause our purpose, pause our agenda, pause our priorities for the greater good of someone else. Not because we want to, but because we need to. It's bigger than me. We've been strolling through this idea, looking at various passages, and we started uh, with the Good Samaritan, and we looked at Abraham and Isaac, and then we talked about lasting impressions. We as believers, the consequences, both positive and negative, that we have on other individuals because of our behavior. And then last week, we talked about letting go and letting God. We looked at Exodus chapter 2, and we hopefully were inspired by the actions of a mother and a father who were find them, found themselves in a very tough predicament. They could, not, they could no longer take care of the blessing <laughs> that God gave them. And so she trusted God. He trusted God in meaningful ways rather than holding on to things. This is a tough pill for us to swallow, Brother Tip. We hold on to things beyond our ability to contribute to them. And the unintended consequences of that is that the things, the people, the ideas become malnourished because we are feeding them beyond what we can provide and what they need. And today we're going to look at a passage. We're going to look at several passages today. Don't be overwhelmed. There's several verses on the screen, <clears throat> but I, I will do my best as the teacher here to make sure it's streamlined and it's all connected. Amen. The first set of scriptures we'll read are uh, chapter one and then verse uh, chapter three, and then we'll read some scriptures in verse four and chapter four. Uh, but let's go ahead and start with chapter one, verses one through three. It's about a guy named Jonah. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. 
But Jonah got up, went in the opposite direction. Say opposite direction. Opposite. To get away from the Lord, he went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. Let's jump to chapter 3. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time, say this time. This time. Jonah obeyed the Lord's commandment and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his, his mind. Hmm. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. Chapter 4, this change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? This change of plans, God changing his mind about destroying a group of people, this change of plans greatly upset Jonah. He became very, he became very angry. He said, God, I know you do this. You soft. You're too loving. You're too kind. You're too merciful. I don't want to see your grace in action. Just go ahead and take my life. Just go ahead and kill me. I don't want to see you spare these wicked people. And the Lord asked a question, is it right for you to be angry about this? Today we're speaking from the subject, uh, selfish salvation. Selfish salvation. Before we transition into our working definition of this term, I want to first acknowledge the two schools of thought here. This phrase, selfish salvation, provokes two schools of thoughts in my mind, Brother Tip. The first one is that we as believers, we as individuals, must ensure that we are not selfish about the act of others becoming saved. All right. Amen. We must not be stingy. We must not be, if I can use this $2 word, parsimonious with the idea that others can be saved too. Yes. What do I mean by that? Uh, we, we cannot be okay with the idea that others are locked out of accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior. Then the other school of thought, if you will, so it's not about the act of becoming saved. Watch this. The other school of thought, Brother Jose, is we struggle, we may struggle with others benefiting from the idea of being saved. Amen. So not just the act of becoming saved, but struggling with the benefits of watching others reap what it means to be saved. Let me give you a very basic example. The Bible makes it very clear that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have become justified in him. We have been made right with him. And, and the Bible says that it is the blood of Jesus Christ that covers every sin that is a benefit of being saved. Amen. The Bible also makes it very clear that there is a, a, a favor and blessing. There are promises associated only to the children of God. And if we are not careful, we can resent individuals reaping the benefits of being saved. This is the premise of our story today. This is kind of the theme of our idea of our learning today. I'm going to give you a few questions for your consideration if you don't mind. How do you feel when other people are blessed? Amen. Can I go deeper with this? Yes, sir. 
How do we feel when our enemy appears to get away with what they've done? (laughs) Oh, I'm coming for you today. (laughs) Here's another question for your consideration. How do we feel about God extending his grace, his mercy, and love to individuals who damaged us? Because if we are honest, Tony, uh, when they damaged us, we got spiritual and said, uh, the vengeance shall be mine, saith the Lord. Uh, I'm not going to put my hands on you. I'm not going to get even because God is going to take care of you. But what happens when God doesn't do anything to the person who hurts you? What happens when God says, I forgive them? I'm going to excuse their behavior. I'm going to extend my grace. And how do we feel about that? See, it's one thing for me to be excited about people that I like, people that I love, people that like me and love me, people that I'm rooting for, or people that are beneath me. And when I say beneath me, I'm talking about not as mature as you spiritually. Uh, What I'm saying is, it's easy for root to root for people that we have affection for. But people that we don't like. This really, this story, Brother Reggie, is about appreciating God's grace God's forgiveness, even when we're not a recipient of it. Y'all know we scholars here. I'm going to give you a definition. I'm going to sit on this for a while. Here's a definition. Selfish salvation, it is a feeling, belief, or attitude. I thank the Holy Spirit for this. All credit goes to him. It is a feeling, belief, or attitude that suggests God can be God for me, but I struggle with God being God for you. God can knock on my door, Sister Ellis, anytime he wants and bless me. But I struggle, Miss Clopton, when he knocks on your door and bless you, especially when I feel like it's my turn. God can be God for me. He can make a way out of no way. He can be God of the impossible. He can be a miracle worker. He can be a healer. He can be a provider. God, sign me up anytime you want to bless me in my life. But do we have the same enthusiasm? When God is Godding for our enemy. Do we have the same level of appreciation and excitement when God is Godding for somebody who hurt our feelings? This is really when we are flirting with this idea, and I'm not saying we are selfish. What I'm saying, hear me, hear me well, we may have selfish tendencies. We may have tendencies that reflect this idea of selfish salvation. Here's the irony about this whole thought. Ms. Evelyn? This right here, if I can go to the classroom for a little bit, this right here in and of itself is contradictory in nature. This is what we call an oxymoron. An oxymoron when two words are side by side next to each other, and they are contrary in nature. They are conflicting in nature. See, the very idea of salvation is contrary to the idea of being selfish. So if we are selfish saints, that means we are carrying on ourselves that is contrary to our Christ. My Bible says, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The idea of offering his son as a sacrifice so we can be saved is the ultimate demonstration of being selfless. So when we are selfish saints, meaning that God is our Lord and Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and we are selfish, we are carrying a disposition or an attitude that is opposite of the Savior who saved us. And while it may seem far-fetched, I need you to think about somebody that you struggle with. Amen. Somebody already got that person on their mind. <laughs> I need you to think about that person that you're not a fan of. Let them be blessed in front of your face. How will you respond? I don't, want to, I don't want to dismiss a very critical point here, Tierra. One of the things that I really want to emphasize, because only saints can be selfish when it comes to their salvation. Believers can only be selfish with their salvation. We cannot miss the important fact of who Jonah is. Yeah. Jonah is a believer like you and me. Jonah has been chosen by God. Yes. Keep in mind the rules of engagement in the Old Testament. A man or a woman had to be selected by God to be a conduit between him and his people. So he was chosen. And watch this. In his choosing, he's not merely just a believer. He is a preacher and a prophet. 
Man, I love God's word because it reminds us that we are not removed from the legitimacy of scripture. I, I know some preachers, some prophets, some deacons, some ushers, some musicians, some praise and worship team leaders. I know of some individuals who we must understand we are not exempt Amen. from this type of behavior. So before we point our finger at Jonah, now there are some lessons that we're going to learn from Jonah today, but I want to make sure, I want to make it abundantly clear to you and me that this man is serving God. Thank you. And yet we see tendencies, we see behaviors that he is selfish about his salvation. We are going to kind of peruse through the first three chapters, and then we're going to settle in at chapter four. Jonah chapter one, we see, I would say, the overarching theme here is um, rooted in this idea of rebellion. Yes, sir. Rebellion, for those of us who need an operating definition, it is a willful disobedience. I'm not ignorant to what I'm doing. I know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm going to do the complete opposite of what you're expecting me to do. I am aware of what the charge is. I'm aware of what you've called me to do, but I'm going to leave the phone off the hook. I'm going to ignore you. I'm not going to respond to you. I'm going to do my own thing. Rebellion. I don't want to unpack that today because uh, that's not the focal point of our message. But you may be asking, our, you may be asking yourself, why does Jonah rebel? He is a preacher. He's a prophet. He is a man of God. Why does he rebel? Watch this. Pride fuels his rebellion. Amen. How do we know this? Pride is the very thing that fuels his rebellion because he, in his mind, concludes he believes that these wicked people are not worthy to be spared. God, I know what you told me to do, but in my opinion. See, when we're praying and talking to God and we use language like, in my opinion, this is what I think, this is what I believe, you could be allowing pride to creep up on you. Can I tell you a little secret lean into this one? God does not care about our opinion. His wisdom, his information, his intellect surpasses anything that we can understand. We are finite beings, but everything about him is infinite, meaning that there are no limits, there are no boundaries, there are no parameters. So if he's telling us to do something and we don't agree in our opinion, it doesn't matter because he sees something and understands something that we don't see. So pride says, you're a judge, but his behavior, Jonah says, I'm a judge too. You got an opinion, God? I got an opinion, too. We see here his rebellion, very overt. It says, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction. He didn't stay at the crib. (laughs) He didn't say, let me pray about it. (laughs) He didn't say, God, let me think on this. He said, I know you telling me to go to Chicago. But I'm going to go on 30 east. I'm going the other direction. Hold on. Is it west or east? East. There we go. I'm going the other direction. I'm going the opposite direction of where you were telling me to go. So I'm not just doing something. I'm intentionally being counterproductive. Man, the boldness, the audacity to do the complete opposite of what God, not just to try to do what he told him to do without a willing heart. He says, I'm not going to do anything that's remotely close to what you're telling me to do. Before we turn our nose up at Jonah, Mm. Mm. what has God been expecting us to do? And we're waiting for signs. We're waiting for wonders. We're waiting for miracles. We're waiting for confirmation. And we've been waiting for two years. We've been waiting for two months. And God has said, I've given you all that you need. And here's the thing that we need to be mindful of. When we rebel against God, go ahead, Thomas, we make ourselves available to some degree of redirection. I don't know why I didn't come up there. It's all good. Stay right here. You're good. Uh, we're, we're, the, the previous slide was supposed to be this idea of being redirected. Jonah in his rebellion... Watch what happens. He gets on this ship and a massive storm tosses the ship to and fro. These brothers on the ship are like, what is going on? The weather called for 70 and clear. And now it's it's, it's just out of nowhere. We got some issues. They start throwing things off the boat. They start crying out. They start panicking. And Jonah is asleep. I I can't I can't bother this today, Nene, but but how many of us are sleep oblivious? 
to the damage that we're calling in other people's lives. How many of us are asleep, oblivious, ignorant to the fact that we are damaging other people's lives because of our disobedience? So, they, so he gets up and they say, look, man, Jonah says, look, just throw me overboard. The God that I serve, he's doing all of this. He throws him overboard and then there's a big fish that comes and captures him, consumes him for three days. And it is in Jonah chapter 2 that we experience this idea of reconciliation. Please know reconciliation, for those of us who need a definition, and I'm going to continue to move on. Reconciliation is when two opposing parties make peace with each other. So we have rebellion, we have redirection, and Jonah is wise enough to say, I need reconciliation with God. He prays. In Jonah chapter 2, and this is a snippet of his prayer, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. Then I said, O Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more towards your holy temple as my life As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. Mm. Okay, here's another question. Again, I can't bother this today, but are we praying out of desperation? Because we don't like where we are? Or are we praying truly with a sense of sincerity because we know we offended God? And and keep in mind that I said reconciliation. I did not say repentance. Because I'm going to show you something later on. There is a fundamental difference between reconciliation, that is two opposing parties coming back together to make peace, and repentance. Those are two different things. Let's keep rolling. Jonah chapter 3. The preacher responds. And we see meaningful results within his ministry. We see uh, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then verse 10, uh, we, we see, Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. Let's, let's walk through this. Verse 1, we see God's grace being extended to Jonah. The fact that he gives him another opportunity to bounce back, that's God extending his grace. Do we need to be reminded of the rules of engagement? This disobedience that we see here, the outright rebellion, if God would have said, yo, I'm going to just take your life now. You playing playing these little games, I ain't got time for it. You you know what you're supposed to do. I'm going to just go ahead and shut it down. I'm going to remove the the anointing of prophet. I'm going to remove the anointing of preacher. But he says, you know what, I'm going to position you to get it right with me. And it is grace. For him to be in the, uh, the big fish, it is grace for him to ask him again to recover from what he's done. In verse 3, we see he is responsive to God's grace because he obeyed the Lord's command and he preached to the folks. Verse 4 through 6, the Ninevites respond to the power of God's word. And then verse 10, so in verse 1, we see God's grace for Jonah. And then in verse 10, we see God's grace extended to the same people that yesterday he deemed wicked. Mm. It is in this moment that Jonah, like you and me, have a decision that we have to make. Here's the thing. They could deserve a whole lot worse. If God did what he needed to do, it would make sense to all of us. But I think where we struggle is when God does things that's an extension of his character that are not logical to us. This is why we say things like, they got what they deserved. Verse 10, it is completely opposite of what Jonah wants to happen. Now we arrive. Jonah chapter 4. Resentment. This is the same guy who's praying, asking God. Reacquaint me with your presence. This is the same guy who obeys God 
and preaches his word. This is the same guy who in preaching his word, God's word, we see the results of his obedience. But because he didn't like the outcome, he becomes resentful. We see a cycle here. Jonah chapter 1 begins with a degree of pride. Jonah chapter 4 is cyclical. We end with some degree of pride. Resentment can be defined as a strong displeasure or anger towards someone. And we're not talking about something tragic or devastating happened to me and I don't understand. This is not the type of resentment or anger that we're talking about. We're talking about a resentment that's projected on God because Jonah didn't like what he did to someone else to save them. The pride, the arrogance to say, you used your powers the wrong way. You used your loving nature on the wrong people. And I don't like it. In verse 1, we see this change of plans. Now we're going we're gonna to dive deep. We see this change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he becomes very angry. Listen to the language here. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? Just kill me now. I'd rather be dead than alive. I want to talk about in this part emotional expectations versus kingdom expectations. Emotional expectations and kingdom expectations. We see here that there's an individual who was fueled by some degree of emotion. And before we get into his emotional state, remember I said I'm using reconciliation and not repentance on purpose? Reconciliation means that you and I have made peace for a season. Repentance means I'm turning away altogether from my behavior. Please watch this. Uh, Peace put a pin in this. I can make peace with God, be delivered in the purpose like the fish did for Jonah, change my behavior, but never let him change my heart. I'm going to run it back. I can make peace with God, reconciliation, be delivered into purpose, because of genuine reconciliation, change my behavior, but never let him change my heart. I, I struggle as a teacher telling you that he repented in Jonah chapter 2. All right. Because repentance in the most literal sense means that the behaviors, the dispositions, the beliefs, the ideologies that put him in the position that he's in, repentance suggests I'm turning away from that very thing. But the thing that made him in Jonah chapter 1, we see the very same thing in Jonah chapter 4. So we cannot say he turned away from behavior because we see the behavior pop up not even two months later. The reconciliation was genuine, but I don't know if we can say repentance. And we have to be mindful of being back in God's good graces for a season because we don't have a changed heart. Hmm. Watch this. I want to to talk about emotional expectations here. Emotional expectations, when they become greater than kingdom expectations, our opinions we feel are more important than God's objective. I know what your mission is, but this is what I think. Emotional expectations over kingdom expectations, we are putting our feelings over an opportunity for someone to be a recipient of his faithfulness. God says, this is an opportunity for me to be faithful, and I can't be faithful if I succumb to your feelings. If I move based off of your feelings, you wouldn't be able to experience my faithfulness. Watch this. Verse 1, we see various emotions. See, the first emotion that we see is that he is angry at God. He is angry at God because God was being God. He's not like David when, 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 when David's uh, baby, when God removed uh, David's baby from a sinful act. Remember uh, David and Bathsheba? And he says, look, I'm going to go ahead and kill this baby because of your behavior. You're not going to mock me. We're not talking about something egregious like that. We're talking about God being God. 
and he's angry that these people are spared. I ask you again, how do you feel when you see others blessed? How do you feel when you, we see our enemies restored? How do we feel when we see the one who talked about us move forward without consequences? Yes, sir. Verse 2, we see a second emotion. He tries to condemn God. He complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to angry, uh, to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn your back from destroying people. He condemns God for being God. This is what makes God God. Fundamentally, in our, this is what makes God different from every other deity. God is God because we don't have to wait to experience his awesomeness by following all these rules. God says you can experience my love now in your brokenness, in your, in your uh, 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 issues, in your mess. You can experience me now. You don't have to follow these rules for a certain period of time. And when you die, you meet me. This is what makes God God. He says the stinky stuff, bring it to me. The awful stuff, bring it to me. I'll restore you. There's nothing you can do to separate me from your love. And, and Jonah is mad because God is being God. God is being God. Again, we're okay with God being God for us. But what happens when I feel like God is being God for someone that I don't like or feel deserves it? Verse 3, this is the epitome of being emotional. Just kill me now. I can't bear it anymore. You too nice, God. You soft, God. Just kill me now. Just get rid of me. So we see anger, we see condemnation, and then we see pity. I want you to have pity on me and relieve me, even though I just condemned you. For being you. <laughs> Not kill me because life is life in. Not relieve me of the burden of my stress. God, I don't know if I can make it because the weight is unbearable. Not kill me because of that. Kill me because you're being a loving God. I don't, ooh, this is good. Watch this. I don't want to see people be a beneficiary of how good you are. <laughs> to just kill me. I can't bear the thought of, 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 and this, honestly, this is, this is, if I can translate this to our everyday reality, uh, people that are on the come up that we don't feel for, uh, we will scroll and we'll see a little clip of something that either is going to give us gratification or frustration. And when I see the first five, 10 seconds that this is a celebration and not a frustrating moment, what do we do? We keep scrolling. Because I can't bear the thought that there's something to celebrate in your life. I can't bear the thought that you overcame before I did. I can't bear. See, if I get mine first, some of us are cool with it. In fact, I'll reach out to you if I was blessed on Tuesday and you got yours on Thursday. I can reach out to you on Thursday. But if you were blessed first on Tuesday and I don't know that I'm getting mine on Thursday, I just got to deal with the fact that you got yours on Tuesday. I'm not reaching out to you because I resent the fact so I'm going to just keep scrolling. I'm going to keep scrolling. <laughs> Could it be? <laughs> this is good. Watch this. <laughs> Some of us are locked out of our own blessings because we can't even appreciate other folks being blessed first. Yes. So watch this, Jared. God will make me sit in the front row and watch person after person after person come on the stage in my life and come and go, dang, they blessed, dang, they blessed, dang, they blessed, dang, they blessed. And, and I'm encouraged initially, I'm going to get mine. I'm encouraged initially, mine is coming. But what happens when yours don't come, it could be because you ain't ready to receive it. You haven't really, ooh, watch this. You haven't embraced the fact that they got theirs regardless of whether or not you get yours. Mm. See, I want people that's going to celebrate with me. Even if their lights do get cut off, you're still going to celebrate with me. Even if you don't get the job, you're still going to celebrate with me. I don't need you to shout because you got something to shout about. Shout with me just because you love me, because you love him, because you want to see good things happening. Mm. 
See, that's the kingdom mindset right there. Hey, because you blessed, I thank God that you blessed. I don't need anything for myself. It's not emotional for me. It's all kingdom for me. I'm glad that you got yours. And because I believe because I'm connected to you, there's something I can learn about what God is doing in your life. Even if it's not tangible, I know there's something that I can learn because of your faithfulness, because of your patience, because of your joy, because of the love you exude. There's something I can glean from you just by being around you. I don't want nothing from you. It's all about God's kingdom. Mm. Mm. But, but when we emotional, when mine come in, they think they better. It's a 2018 anyways. They should have checked the car facts. That job, they don't know how hard it's going to be. We, we do things from a place of emotion and just saying, man, I'm happy for you. I'm happy. Look, look, no strings attached. Just I'm happy for you. God is, I know where you came from. I know what you desire. I'm just happy for you. If God doesn't do anything for me, in fact, I'm going to check in a week from now just to make sure everything is going well. I'm happy for you. See, those are the real ones. Don't just celebrate me when I announce it. Check in on me to make sure I'm still good once I've settled into the blessing. Oh, but he throws a pity party. And in verse 4, this is very profound here. The Lord replied with the question, Is it right for you to be angry about this? This is the ultimate level. See, preachers can be petty too. Absolutely. Don't y'all say amen too loud now. All them ushers back there just start smiling and saying, shown up. That's their previous church home. They ain't talking about this one. Preachers and prophets. Look at what he does. Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. The level, the audacity. God just told you what he's going to do. We have gone, here's our next point, from a pity party to a pride party. You know what, God? I know what you say. Maybe in my pouting, you'll change your mind. Maybe in my attitude, you'll change your mind. Let me break this down for you. Watch this. Before I get to verse 5, this question that God asked Jonah, it brings about three thoughts. Three thoughts in my mind. I couldn't land on one, so I said, Holy Spirit, help. let me get all three of them to share with God's people for, for their consideration. <clears throat> the first thought is God's question, though it's rhetorical, reminds Jonah and us that there is one judge. What are you angry for? I'm the only one who anger, whose anger actually matters because I am a judge. So while this question is rhetorical, it can be designed to provoke something in his thinking. God, you know what? You're sovereign. You're a judge. You're a judge. The second thought that, that we can consider in the question, God's question, though it's rhetorical, it reminds Jonah and us that we cannot afford to forget that we've been recipients of God's mercy and grace. Again, is it right for you to be angry about this? See, I, I hear in my voice when God says this, have you forgotten? Just like last month, you rebelled against me. You weren't angry then when you were spared. Why are you angry now? So, so the first one is about, hey, you're not a judge. I'm a judge. The second one is, have you, are you suffering from spiritual amnesia? The, the, second, the third thought here is God's question with the proper conviction should have motivated Jonah to go from a pity party to a praise party. God, you know what? I was tripping, but I'm thankful that you spared them because you spared me. God, I'm thankful that you're looking out for them because I was tripping last month and you looking out for them now. God, I'm thankful that they are a recipient of your love just like I was a recipient. What can I do? What, what, what can I do to help these individuals? 
Man. See, if we in pity parties, oh, this is good. Watch this. I think fundamentally pity parties for a moment, it speaks to our human condition. Yes. Watch this, though. The moment a pity party becomes a season. Yeah. 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 See, this is a season now. Because when God asked the question to Jonah, he doesn't respond. He tried to pull him out of the moment. But Jonah said, no, I don't want this to be a moment. I want this to be a season. That's good. See, when pity parties are a moment and they become a season, pride only refuels that resentment. Let me, let me break down verse 5, man. In case you're wondering why he went east, this man, give me a, give me a chair real quick. Tip, give me a chair real quick. I, I'm, I'm going to, the, the, the degree of pride here. There you go, Bishop. My fault. I put you on the spot. Thank you, sir. Got his all black on. Let's go. So he says, y'all want to show him some love? That's fine. Y'all can. <laughs> so he says, God, I'm mad. I can't believe you did this, man. And he says, should you be angry? He doesn't respond to God's question. But he does respond to his question. Not verbally but his feet. I'm angry at you, God. And I'm going to go to the east of the city, watch this, and I'm going to get comfortable because maybe, just maybe, you'll do what you, I think you should have done. So I'm not watching to praise you. I'm watching from a place of pride for you to reinforce my pity and give me what I want. See, sometimes we have to be mindful. Are we spectating and watching, hoping that God will change his mind for us? Out of pity, out of complaining, out of pride. This dude posts up and say, maybe he'll change his mind. I'm not, there's nothing about this that I'm going to celebrate. I'm, I'm here just to watch the city be, maybe, just maybe, he'll actually destroy them like they deserve. A preacher. A prophet says, I want to see, I want to relish the potential idea that God is going to burn it all. A man of God, a believer, when people actually fall and fail in our presence, how do we feel? Is there gratification? Is there a sense of satisfaction? Or do we feel bad for them? What we do, are y'all quiet? What we do, and we have to be careful, when someone eventually falls, we are eager to share the news with others. We're eager. We have to be mindful, and it's not, see, we won't say I'm glad about it, but we're glad about it. Right. Because again, they got what they deserve. We never once prayed that they would be spared. We never once prayed that God would extend his grace and mercy. We were just waiting, sitting down, watching. It's bound to happen sooner or later. Yep, I see the trap happening. I see it unfolding. Yep, and ooh, this is good. Watch this. And what we do, while this is not in scripture, uh, uh, Corbin uh, and, and, and uh, uh, Reggie, come up here real quick. What we do is uh, um, we, we join people to join our pity party. Mm. How long do you think it's going to be before they actually? <laughs> I give it about a week. What you think? Yeah, about, about two days. Corbin said about two days. How much you want to bet on it? I bet. How much you want to bet? You said two days. I say a week. This is what we do. And Maxine, we call ourselves saved. We ain't praying for deliverance. We ain't praying for grace. We have convened, and it's truly a pity party, not of one anymore, but of multiple people who have gathered not to celebrate the goodness of God, not to celebrate the grace of God, not to celebrate the mercy of God, but we've come to celebrate an individual who has been judged by God. And, and see, this is where amnesia is so tricky because we lost friends we lost the, the, the dynamic of our relation, uh, the relationships with specific people, and our lives changed because they were witnesses to our falling, and they didn't do anything about it. So we become the very thing that we resented in our season when it was our turn to be judged and condemned, and we don't realize that we've inherited something that broke our backs. 
Mm. All because of pride. Who is around you? And what are y'all? I, 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 and this is, this is a challenge. This is a tough. We can be hurt and damaged by the same person. But I dare somebody in your square, your circle, or your triangle to say, you know what? Let's change the narrative. Let's pray for them. Amen. Amen. I'm going to do you one better. Let's ask God how we can be a part of the blessing and the restoration process. You talk about Christ's love? Hold on, hold on. That changes the game. Not just pray. Yeah, I know. We're struggling, Brittany. I see you over there. Not just pray for them, but how can we get together to be a blessing to someone who hurt all three of us? Yeah, you talk about agape love. You talk about Christ love. You talk about sacrificial love. You talk about it's bigger than me type love. How can we put our heads together? And watch this, Miss Shirley. We're going to bless them anonymously. They don't need to know we're praying for them. We're just praying. They don't need to know we're putting a package together in the mail and we're not going to put a return address on it. They just need to know they're going to be blessed. And the only people that know about it is the three of us and God. That's Christ's love right there. Mm. So we need to change our party to either a prayer party or a praise party, but we can't do pity parties no more. And we definitely can't do pride parties no more. Where we together come together and we start functioning as God. Right. Right. Glory, glory. Betting on people's downfall. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Betting and making wages on how tragic the downfall will be. Yes, sir. Mm. Pity parties. Mm-hmm. And we call ourselves Christians. Fellas, y'all can have a seat. So we, the gentleman went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under. Okay, this is good. Verse 6. And the Lord, so let me, before we read it, eyes on me real quick. All of this, I can't wait to show you God's sovereignty in all of this. Amen. God asks a question, but he doesn't respond. So God says, now I got to show you a couple things. And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant. So where he left, I want to bring us back. Yeah, I'm going to go watch this. God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there, and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful. For the plant. I'm going to teach you in a second. Don't worry about it. But God also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm, the worm, um, through the stem of the plant, yeah, ate through, thank you, ate through the stem of the plant, so it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. God's sovereignty, this is what we learn in verses 6 through these several verses here. God can do a thing, but God can also destroy a thing. And in his doing and in his destroying, there are lessons we can learn. Let's walk through this again. Watch this. The Lord God arranged. So in his pouting, God arranged a leafy plant to provide shade for him. But here's where we go wrong, and this is, this is why I paused. He put it over his head. He felt good. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. He's grateful for provision, but he's not grateful for the provider. God, you can bless me. I'm grateful for the blessing, but I'm not going to thank you for being a blesser. So I'm grateful for what you're doing for me, but I don't thank you for you doing it for me. That's good. Mm. This, this, this is critical. This reinforces the sense of pride and selfish nature that it, as long as I'm good, I'm good. But anything you dis- do to disrupt my rhythm, my flow, now I got an attitude. And then it said, God arranged the leafy plant. Okay, you can't, you can't recognize that I put the plant there, so I'm going to send something else. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
God also arranged for a worm. This worm, the next morning, ate through the stem of the plant. God provides the shade. He provides the comfort. But he also provides that thing to eat away at the very thing that you were comfortable in. It, it gets better. And as the sun grew hot, God is flexing his muscles. As the sun grew hot, God arranged, God arranged the plant. God arranged the worm. But he said, son, let's hang out for a second. S-U-N, let's hang out for a second. We're going to turn it up a little bit because my son need to learn something. He doesn't seem to understand how, how it actually works. I'm a judge. I'm sovereign. I'm all powerful. I'm all magnificent. I'm everywhere at the same time I do what I want to do. I'm a great. So son, come hang out with me for a second. I got the plant on my side. It's done its function. I got the worm on my side. It's done its function. But now that there is no shade, son, I have a task for you. God arranged Oh, wind, you can come hang out too. <laughs> the sun is where it needs to be at the right temperature. Wind, I need you to make it very uncomfortable. That hot heat just hit on the back of his head. I don't know if he was a bald-headed brother. He had locks. But for whatever, it was hot. It was uncomfortable. And God orchestrated it all. Look how many times you said God arranged. God arranged the leafy plant. God arranged the worm. Uh, God arranged the scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this. And we move on. Verse 9, we, we almost done. Verse 9, this is so important. Then God said to Jonah, this brother is bold. It, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes. Not he responded, he retorted. Yes. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? This is the last point. We see the blinding nature of pride. The blinding nature. Verse 9, we see he's fueled by emotions, and he, his emotions and fulfillment are driven by self first. Watch this. These, this is a variation of what he said. I cannot, he cannot see his own selfish nature. Yeah. Look, at all, look at all the things he says or insinuates. Yeah. I don't want to preach the word to the people I don't feel. Listen to I and me. I don't want to preach the word to the people I don't feel they deserve it. I don't want to see these people saved. I messed up. God, forgive me. I knew you would do this for them. Kill me now. The plant you removed was no longer beneficial for me. A preacher and a prophet cannot see because of pride how blind he is to his own selfish nature. Verse 10, and the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and it died quickly. See, we have to be mindful that sometimes our investments, as fleeting as they are, we're attached to it because we know it's for us. But can we be attached to agendas beyond our own well-being and comfort? God could be using things around us to show things to us about us. Amen. He's using the plant. He's using the sun. He's using the worm Amen. to convey a point to our friend Jonah, but he's blind. He misses the lesson. Verse 11, Nineveh has over 120,000 people that are dark in spiritual darkness. Should not feel sorry for them. He cannot see the big picture. He only sees you messed my agenda. And here's a fun fact. Jonah chapter 4, this is how it ends. There is no Jonah chapter 5, we see him restore or try again. This is how it ends. And, and I wondered, God, why do we just end here? 
I, I, don't, I don't have an answer. I'm not going to speculate, but I don't think it's an accident that we see the story end with a man the very way it started. All right, all right. Pride in the beginning, pride at the end. And God asked a question, and this time it's not even documented how Jonah responds. I wonder, this is truly an I wonder, I'm not saying God told me this, I wonder if that the scripture stopped, the Holy Spirit stopped inspiring man to write this part of it because anything more that we would have saw in Jonah's life would have been detrimental to us. Because we have a person in an official position. See, we see David's restoration. We see Elijah's restoration. We see Jeremiah. We see these other, we see the ups and downs and things to celebrate. But Jonah, man, I'm not condemning, but I just wonder if God's way of love, his grace is saying, I got to stop this part of the narrative. Because if I overexpose you to what it means to be okay with pride in the beginning and the end of what I'm trying to show you, it can be detrimental to you. Here's our big idea. Watch this. If others are unworthy of his grace and mercy, then we are too. Yeah, that hit different. (laughs) So before we get to pointing, understand that all it takes is one sin to disqualify all of us. And some of us, we failed this morning. Not trying to be funny, not trying to be judgmental, but we failed this morning. And it is God's grace that we are still here in our right minds. We are still here for a plan and a purpose. So if they are unworthy, we are unworthy too. The root of all of this Thank you, Holy Spirit. I believe we talked about how pride fuels wanting others to fall and fail or be okay with others falling and failing. But I think for some of us, it's not just pride. Pride sometimes runs parallels. It runs parallel to ideas like the unwillingness to forgive. And so if I'm struggling forgiving others, if I'm struggling to a degree forgiving myself, pride reinforces that and I don't remain open to people being restored because of God's love. But keep in mind how this works. If we don't forgive, the condemnation that we put on others because we don't forgive, the Bible makes it very clear, God can't forgive us. To be an un- So we talked about selfish saints, to be an unforgiving saint is an oxymoron in and of itself. Amen. The very idea of our faith is built on a loving God forgiving an undeserving people. Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Some of you thought of specific individuals. You don't have to say who it is. You don't have to say what they did. You don't have to say what you, how you feel about them. But with them on your mind, in your own way, quietly, without disrupting the person next to you. Have God check the issues in your heart around what you wanted for this person compared to what God needs for this person. The Bible doesn't say that he just died, Jesus just died for just, oh, black folks, white folks, those who get it. He made himself available to all people to all. Spirit of the living God, we thank you for your word today. We may be unintentionally wrestling with selfish tendencies, even though we are believers. And while there is a lot that we talked about, we highlighted in Jonah's life, let us not fail, let us Let us see that sometimes the greater lessons are not necessarily what to do, but what not to do. And there's a lot that we learn today about what not to do. We should celebrate, we should appreciate the fact that individuals can be recipients of your love and grace just like us. Because it's your love and grace that gives us hope, it gives us future, it gives us meaning. We should be willing vessels to share that with others and celebrate with others. 
For those individuals who have been harboring bitterness, resentment in their hearts, pray that you forgive them, release them from the bondage and the baggage of pride, unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness, relieve them. This moment in and of itself is an act of grace. It's an opportunity to be a recipient of your mercy, your love. Let us not lose sight of that because we all need you. Now, God, as we prepare to partake in communion, I pray that we lean into the sacred element of that moment where our God, our Father, sent his son, Jesus, to die for us. The most selfless act known to humanity. To die for people where many of us wouldn't appreciate the sacrifice itself. Where many of us would live lives navigating broken promises, empty promises, not being all the way in, but you sent them anyways to die for us. Wow. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to truly maximize the grace and mercy that you give us each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we'll partake in communion. We ask that you remain quiet and